construct a tunnel on your side avenue and a transit priority mall on third avenue uh, to create a transit spine to get uh, as many of the diesel buses as we can off the street and uh, underneath or uh, at transit stations at both ends of the city with primarily electric vehicles uh, on the surface on the third avenue uh, mall. Very expensive. Very, very necessary. Almost half the people who work downtown still come downtown by bus. But you know, if you can walk through town faster than you can get through by bus, you might not stay on the bus very long. It's going to become a less desirable alternative. So it's real critical. The federal government likes our proposal because it's based on a rubber tire system. Dual mode buses, uh, in, uh, those buses that run on diesel, uh, on the freeway and the express lanes, articulated dual mode buses running uh, uh, electrically in the tunnel uh, and in downtown. Those are, that technology is available, it does work. Um, the federal government, which is gonna pay between 10 and 20% of whatever we do, uh, maybe up to 30 or more percent, uh, is very interested in our system because most cities are coming at them um, for big, heavy investments in rail. We're not really ready system, but whatever we do under the city, underground, will be convertible uh, to rail in the future, so you have that right of way for urban. I think it's a pretty good system, pretty costly, could be conflicted between the suburban jurisdictions to say, why put all this in Seattle? And we're not just going to have a piece of concrete, it's going to be attractive, and whether the suburban jurisdictions will want to pay for part of that uh, is still area policies, which are now before the council, land use policies. Um, we've written pretty uh, restrictive zoning uh, to protect that incursion out into the neighborhood from core area business districts. But we've also, uh, in the larger districts, we've written policies that will encourage the development of small business and small business expansion in those neighborhoods. Um, there's been a a land use war going on between the business district and uh, the community surrounding it. Both the single family land use policies and the multifamily land use policies have been enacted. And we think there's protection out there, but um, the neighborhood commercial area policies uh, will help to define those borders between commercial, uh, automobile, parking, the kinds of conflicts, and the neighborhood. That's a physical uh, protection. The most important thing disadvantage uh, economically that exists in a family buying a house here and buying one house in Portland. Uh, we have protected, physically, we've protected the single family neighborhood. What's killing us is the single family house in that neighborhood that is electrically heated and the single parent trying to live there with two kids and work and pay for that. Uh, demographic changes that uh, are just rapid and economic problems of uh, our typical Seattle single-family neighborhood are enormous. That's why trying to keep the rate increases down and keep the, keep the load off those people is, is real important. And the, finally, the other thing is to, uh, I spend a lot of time on the schools. Um, I believe that, that we're coming back with children. I mean, almost everybody I know city is becoming you know, a more attractive alternative in many ways than the suburban cul-de-sac. Um, so we have uh, families coming back and trying to stay in the city. Uh, but they've got to have good public schools. Because another <coughs> economic disincentive to living in the city is the cost that you may have to pay to put your child in a private school. So 
So working to keep uh, the maximum amount of choice and curriculum and good quality in, in public education, working to get the school fund, as you pronounced it, Taylor Brown, uh, to fix up those places. We've closed 30 schools. We've closed 17 schools alone in 1981. So fixing up a physical plant and providing for that public education opportunity is probably causing problems in neighborhoods is life. And the fact that uh, the houses in Seattle tend to be less expensive than in the suburban areas, consequently there's a lot of investment pressure to buy up those houses, taking away the opportunity for uh, single parent families to buy those homes. Well, both the housing preservation ordinance, which says you can't tear it down unless you replace it, serious deterioration of life uh, where we can abate, plus the land use policy um, provides some protections. But what encouraging um, rental housing is, um, is pretty important here. You know, we went through that period where uh, the condominium conversions were going on like crazy. We had the rent control ordinance, um, the rent control initiative on the ballot. We went through some tough um, times there around protecting rental stock, and we just about had to, we were down in vacancy rate in rental housing, we were down to below 2% vacancy rate, which is hardly enough to cover people just moving around. So we had a real problem of scarcity. Now we have a problem of price in rental housing. Um, I think the policy, the single family policy, um, uh, protect that duplex income, triplex income, single family neighborhood, and the multifamily zoning, uh, where you can accept a little higher density provide more flexibility for the builder in developing uh, multi-family uh, housing. We don't, we're not so uh, strict on the way this place sits on the lot. Um, we open up a lot of flexibility for the architect and the developer to create something more cost effective. I hope that. The answer is no. <laughs> well, um, okay, I'll go with you on that. <laughs> That's a question that many of our citizens are asking. Uh, it's one I'm asking. Um, I think it's silly uh, that we're in this kind of situation. Um, and I wish I had known that we were getting there before we got there. Yes? I have worked in certain health care more than, <coughs> more than 10 years. And <coughs> you had alluded earlier in your comments about detailed internal are going up, um, and here we've got people suing each other in the courts. It's very difficult for me to explain to people um, what's going on, taxpayers, ratepayers. We've got to get these this litigation and this formal complaint activity behind it. There's going to be a pluralistic futility. Uh, affirmative action is the highest priority, personnel priority I have. This city government will look like the city it serves. Long run, that will benefit us in so many substantial ways. I was with the National Education Association panel uh, the other day talking about desegregation. Is there anything more controversial then and now than busing? Uh, Boston went to war as a product of um, through locks of school kids. Um, northern cities went to war over busing. Today, the kids who came in. wasn't a big deal. 
what they wanted to know is what our teachers want to do to give us a little more choice. Why can't we have computers in the classroom? Why can't they were talking about education there. That's behind us now. We don't have to discuss transportation and race every single waking day in trying to run the school district. And it's created an environment where you can start talking about education. We have to create an environment and help to create an environment in Kansas City where we're past litigation, where we're past warfare, uh, where we're past the formal complaining process. Uh, you do that with affirmative action. And then start talking about how we can get back the respect for the people who pay our salaries and pay for our electricity. Now that's a longer road than changing attitudes of people uh, takes a while, and you don't change it. You know, another piece in that <coughs> book that I went to Church of Excellence, that I thought was maybe the single most telling statement in it, says you can tell an organization to reorganize, you can reorganize it, you can restructure it, you can tell it to go in this direction, but the organization really does pretty much what its leadership does. It goes in that direction. You can tell this organization that um, it's got to do conservation. You can tell this organization it's got to be a representative of our community. We're a public agency, a public institution, a government agency, and we're going to look like the city we serve. Um, you can tell it to be democratic. You can tell it to do all of those good things. But it's going to take some time for change to occur. And our expectations of it in the political system are that it changes like that. Next week, it's got to change. If it doesn't, we criticize the hell out of it, and we go uh, into litigation over it. So <coughs> it's going to take some time. I want to make certain that you know um, that um, we're not probably going to make um, a lot of progress until we put resolve through process, public process issues that are in dispute either in the courts or in uh, any kind of rights uh, agency activity. Now, I'm afraid I've got to run because I have a council member waiting for me in my office at 1 o'clock, and uh, I don't want to keep him waiting too long. But thank you very much.